So you should have a copy of that uh, checklist. I'm going to open it up. I put together this checklist of uh, general ideas um, regarding WordPress. These things still apply if you had a Tumblr blog or even if you, to some degree, if you have a, um, a social media account. So this is called a WordPress checklist, everything you need to think about for writing long-form blog content. So remember, long-form blog content or long attention span, WordPress, short attention span blog content, short-form blog content, Tumblr. I've divided it into three main sections, planning, writing, and then promoting. So the more of these that you engage in, the better. I'm not saying you have to do all of these, like 20 things, all the time. I'm saying look at these, think of how many you can do, and then do them. So let's talk about each of these. I've, I've got uh, the general idea and then a jumping off point, and then we'll actually apply them when, when we get to that after the break. The very first item that I have here regarding planning is decide on a hosted versus self-hosted solution. Will your site be on one of the free platforms like WordPress.com or Tumblr.com, or will it be on your own server, such as Victor.com slash blog? In this class, we created a WordPress.com account. So just for this class, the answer is obvious. We're going to have our blog on WordPress.com. And we do that in this class because it's free. I don't want to ask you to pay for anything in this class. And so we created a WordPress.com account last week and we'll retrieve it today to work on it. I'm also going to make some notes here. And uh, my note about this first item, planning number one, is uh, they both have their, their pros and cons. I would highly recommend the best thing to do is to use your own server. You want your own server with your own branding, your own domain name. Because the, um, the hosted solution and the self-hosted. Hosted is that you're on WordPress.com and you will have Victor's blog.wordpress.com. Self hosted, you have Victor's blog.com. Which would you prefer? Most likely the one without the WordPress branding, that it has your name. So the, the hosted one, free. The self hosted, not free. When you get self-hosted, you're going to need to invest in a domain and, um, and uh, what do they call it again? Hosting. Domain and hosting. The domain is the name of your website and the hosting is where you upload your pictures, your text, all of that stuff. And it's not free. And it ranges between, you know, very, very, very cheap, like $12 uh, dollars per year to $200 dollars per year. Just a huge range, depending on what services you need. How much, how many resources, how much space, how fast you need the, the, the account to be in all of that. And like I'm saying, my recommendation is self-hosted because it gives you the most flexibility. The WordPress account that we created last week that we're going to get back into is very powerful, but it's got the limitation of having the WordPress.com branding in your address, number one. And number two is that it is limited to some of the features. You cannot add extra plugins to the WordPress.com 
the not the, the free version. You cannot add e-commerce features without paying a lot. And so it's like training wheels. The one we created last week is training wheels, which is fine. We want to learn how to blog. All the other details we can get to later. But with the self-hosted one, you can add plugins, you can add e-commerce, you can uh, do anything you want with that. Basically, you, you own it. As long as you keep paying. Uh, no, that $12 is for the self-hosted, and that's a possible price for the hosting and the domain. Uh, it really ranges per company. That's These are just some very wide range of prices, because I've seen it that cheap and uh, much more expensive. The second item, uh, develop a series concept. What can you write about? in the long term. A blog should entice people to come back to your site time after time. Plan content that you would be happy to write about. That's what we spent time last time to talk about, wasn't it? We spent uh, the end of the day, people volunteered what their site was about or their concept, and then we brainstormed. That was a very good exercise, I think. We helped each other out with thinking of ideas about what would you like to read about. So for us, this is already done. We've got some ideas for writing on the long term, because the optimal term there is long term. I forget the exact statistic, but there was uh, some article that I read that said, uh, you know, the average lifespan of a, of, of a blog is three months, in that someone is really happy to do it for three months. And then, then the fourth month, uh, I'm out of ideas, I don't have time, I've got to pick up the kids, etc. So then suddenly it's been six months since you updated your blog, one year. And so long term, it could. Um, being long term helps your SEO because you're putting out this content, creating content that the search engines find. Google, Yahoo, Bing, AOL, Lycos, all those search engines. Maybe you only use Google and you think that's the only one. Not true. Bing is the second largest search engine. It's actually increasing in usage while Google is decreasing slightly. Uh, but uh, Bing is increasing. Yahoo is also important in terms of search. Uh, so if you take my SEO class, uh, we talk in there about setting ourselves up so that our website can be found by Google and Bing and Yahoo, and that's about like 90% of traffic. Um, if you didn't know, Google has about 62% of traffic. Uh, you might have thought it would be 100%, but no. Throughout uh, the U.S. and globally, Google is the largest search engine, but it's quote-unquote only 65% traffic out of hundreds of millions, probably billions of searches. And then so Bing, second place, 20%, that's still hundreds of millions, if not billions, of searches. So for the long term, create content. You're going to create, develop this series like we thought about previously. Some sort of recipe of the month, uh, tip of the week, um, what else did we think about? Um, testimonial blog posts, stuff that you can put out on a regular basis. You don't want to fall prey to that statistic again that you're out of ideas, you have nothing more to write about, you're burnt out, you take the time to brainstorm, and at the end of the day when we have more the lab time, if you'd like more one-on-one uh, -on -one help about you developing your idea, we can do that. <coughs> Number three, variety. Within your niche of expertise, plan on writing on a variety of related Topics. Instead of always writing about one subject, plan on writing on two to three related ones. So on number three, I would say think of the concept of relevancy. 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 Uh, relevancy. Is it relevant to your readers? Slash customers slash potential 
customers? Is it important? Is it relevant? Would people care about what you wrote? Is it relevant? Um, if I've got a bakery and I'm blogging about my, uh, let's say I've developed a concept where every month I'm blogging the recipe of the month. I have this great uh, almond florentine recipe, so this month I'll write about it. I'll I'll have some cool pictures that make people hungry. I'll write a little bit about the history of our version of the recipe, and then a link to, to buy it now. And then next month, I might do another recipe of the month, and next month, and next month, and next month. Well, that will work, but variety is also important. So maybe I'm going to include, once a quarter, I'm going to have an employee spotlight. In my bakery, I might have like three pastry chefs. It might be interesting to write a blog post about each of them, once a quarter. So that would be, you know, four blog posts per year. And every month, I'm doing a recipe of the month. And then every three months, you know, once a quarter, I'm writing this spotlight post about one of my pastry chefs. I'm sure they're interesting people. They probably, you know, they might have been self-taught. They might have been educated formally. Uh, what's their history behind wanting to be in my bakery and such? And that helps with your variety. Instead of people reading the same thing over and over, oh, another recipe of the month, something different. That's why we spent that time also previously brainstorming of ideas. So, variety. Related topics. Let me say related in quotes because what is related can be very subjective. It can be very tangential. It can be, it can be off, off uh, it can be out of left field, but still related. So let's say with my bakery, um, you know, would you have thought of having that? Would you have thought of reading that kind of blog post, the spotlight on the chef? Um, perhaps we can do um, a blog post related to some other aspect of nutrition. Uh, maybe our pastries are not the most nutritious ones because they taste good, uh, but maybe we talk about related um, alternative uh, sweeteners. You know, there's stevia that's pretty hot at the moment, uh, monk fruit extract, and all of that. So what 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 can be different? What variety can you impart that is still relevant when you when you blog? Because the more content you put out the more the search engines could find, the more then you can be found when someone searches. Number four, going solo or not. Are you going to write everything yourself? Are you going to have other people in your organization write as well? Are you going to have ghost writers, guest writers, paid writers? This is a big question here because How do you deal with burnout? You're going to get burnt out. You're going to have great ideas. You might develop 10 articles that you're going to put out once per month, or maybe you want to do once per week. That's 10 weeks of content. And then well, what are you going to do on the 11th week? What are you going to do on the 11th month? Uh, you might get burnt out, especially if you're running the business yourself and you're doing payroll and you're doing all of that stuff and selling, and now I've got to write again. And then you fall behind this month, and another month, and then it's six months, and you haven't updated. And then you're not really relevant on search results as much anymore. So to deal with burnout, I have some suggestions here. Are you going to do it yourself or not? Are you going to have other people in your organization write? So again, my Victor's Bakery fictional company, I wanted to write it every month, but I've got to run the business as well. So perhaps I'm going to get other people from my company to write. But I will say, if you get others to write also, make sure they want to write. Leads into this, are you going to write some comic related articles for my blog? Uh, that'd be cool, yes. Um, do they want to write? Becky and payroll is doing payroll. 
do you want her to also write, to put things aside and write about your company? Uh, yeah, she works for it, she likes the company and all that, but she's got stuff to do. And then to have her write a hundred words, which is not so much, but on top of her other duties. Are you going to have John, uh, are you going to force John into writing a hundred word blog post this month if he's got to deal with this and that and this and that? So whoever you do enlist within the company, make sure they want to write, because then it'll show with low quality results. And so if you are going to have others in your company, make sure, uh, hopefully, they can write good, I mean well, and that they, and that they want to write for the company. Okay. Shouldn't you take this course maybe two or three months? That would be nice as well. Maybe all my courses, yes. So, okay, let's say that's not a, quite a possibility. Everyone's doing their own job. We have other possibilities. Yes? I was thinking maybe it's not for a service or a product for yourself, a company, but there's a lot of associations or networking groups, um, public library, um, church groups, whatever, that may even want a presence to get the word out. Are you thinking about it in terms, though, of getting them to write for you, or you writing for them? Well, work for a A community service, let's say, a veterans organization, what have you, they want to get their word out, so they could initiate a writing, mm -hmm. and maybe somebody, maybe it gets passed around every month, a different input from the different members. Yeah, that's that's very that's a very good idea. That's that's what I got right here about. Are you going to have other people in your organization write? So, yeah, obviously they want to write. They would want to write to do it, but that's a good idea. Having different members of a particular organization do the one hundred word blog post once a month, and then you've got content on the long term. You get some variety from two different perspectives. Different voice, different perspective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, along with what she was just saying, I, my concern is that if you have other people, if say you, you have an organization. They want to, they have an event. When does your blog go cross over from being an ad to be a blog? And is there a difference? If someone, if you have someone write a sort of thing about an event they're having, a uh, play or something at their church, um, does that actually become an ad? And um, yeah, uh, and it might not matter uh, because all of this, in 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 some sense, are ads. These tweets that I'm putting out are ads. These blog posts that I'm putting out are ads. And I use the, ad, the term ad very loosely. It doesn't have to always be a blog post and then it says, and by now. You know, it doesn't have to be that blatant all the time. It's fine to do that once in a while. And I can't really tell you, like, make sure that 2% of your blog posts are, are ad related. You know, I'm not going to say a percentage of any sort of like thing like that. It's really up to you to decide how you want to manage it all. But it's perfectly fine and encouraged for the concept of the blog to be a form of marketing, of advertising, of ads. Just like your Facebook posts are that as well. Your Pinterest post. You may love to use Pinterest, but in the back of your mind you should always be thinking about how am I going to use Pinterest to sell my products? How am I going to use my blog to get more clients? So yeah, you're going to be publishing great, useful, interesting stuff, but always in the back of your mind to some degree, how am I going to use this blog post to sell something? And I know I say those terms all over and over, your, broad, your product, your blog, uh, your company, etc. But it applies to your nonprofit organization, you're putting your name out as a trying to get hired, you're getting attention for your paintings, whatever you're trying to do. But yes, uh, it's fine to keep it in terms, or have it in terms, couch it in terms of, of ads. How blatant do you want to be? As long as you can until, you're, uh, until your readers get tired of it. So you don't want to uh, alienate them by every post that you're doing every month to be like and buy and click here to buy now. You know it is an art and a science, and I can't exactly say how to do it, but you get it. You get the hang of it as you do it, and as you read your colleagues. I don't know if I have it here, but one thing to note is yes, I, I said it last time. Read what your colleagues are doing. Look up in your space, in your niche, in your topic. Look up what's the competition doing. Um, so maybe I'll put it back here under number three, variety, research the competition. What are they doing? 
what are they writing about? Can you write something similar in your own voice, in your own style, with extra content? Don't rip them off, of course, write in your own voice, and uh, you have more ideas there. Yes? Question. I'm not so familiar with um, the radio version of the blog. It's the pod, podcast. Podcast? No one does that as well. But would you say maybe blogging is electronic equivalent of a podcast, which is more so cinematic radio? A lot of people have podcasts on as part of their blog. Those are, more, really, those are some of my favorite blogs. You know, they have uh, nice articles, nice blog posts, long form articles, uh, and then they also have podcasts. You know, maybe one or two a week, uh, and they're all just in the blog. You know, it's, a, it's a category of the blog, podcasts. So a podcast, let's take a little segue off on that. A podcast is, uh, is basically internet radio. It's a radio show that anyone can create and then uh, publish, and it can be as long as you want, two minutes, two hours. And so iTunes has, has made uh, podcasts pretty famous. Uh, the term podcast came from the mixing of the term iPod and broadcast. So, um, uh, I forget his name, uh, I believe Michael Savage is credited as uh, like the father of podcasting, modern podcasting, because this stuff always evolves. And, you know, 10 years ago, this guy started to put, to record, um, you know, these, these radio, uh, the, record these audio uh, episodes of interviews and such and put them online and then eventually the iPod came out in iTunes and then you go to iTunes and you can subscribe and then every week or whatever that the podcast is published it automatically downloads to your phone and then you listen to an episode. Yes? I think the way I'm actually seeing it go is I think other things can start moving more to podcasts because they're more interesting. You don't have to be in front of your computer or your, you know, device to read them. You can have them playing in the background while you're doing work, you know, and, and I'm starting to see a lot of the stuff I used to read, it's now just being it's transformed into podcasts, which I kind of prefer. It's pretty cool. I like podcasts a lot. I listen to them all the time. I listen to a variety of podcasts on a variety of topics, and so um, that I would love to teach a class on podcasting in the future. Um, the, the thing with podcasts is there's such a variety. NPR has a podcast. It, has anyone heard of the Serial podcast? It's like one of the big breakthrough stars in podcasting. It's come from NPR. Uh, here's Bill Nye. Um, and so um, I just have iTunes open. We've all got iTunes on our computer so you free download. Um, and you can go here and look up and search on topics. Find me podcasts about science, about technology, about uh, comedy about uh, uh, life or whatever and you're going to see a variety of, of podcasts out there and so uh, another form to reach an audience maybe someone doesn't have time to sit down and read your blog post but what if you also do an audio version of it where it's not that you read it word for word but you have this idea of a, of a podcast uh, uh, of, a, of a topic that you wrote and then you um, and then you you, you discuss about it freeform style and record and it lasts five minutes and then you upload it to iTunes and anyone then can download it and listen to it. You can attach it directly to your blog post as well and then someone can download it and, and listen to it on the commute. So in a form it's like audiobooks. Um, video, yeah, vlogs. Yeah, just another way to to get out there in front of people. But isn't the equipment kind of heavy uh, in terms of creating I, um, um, these things? I don't know. They could be. They could be. It could be as expensive as you want because look at this: Chevy Chase and Gilbert Gottfried on this podcast. So big names in comedy. Um, it could be expensive. Yes, you could spend easily two thousand dollars on a microphone, just a microphone, and then of course you know nineteen hundred dollars on a laptop. But it could be as, as easy as recording it off your phone. You've already got the phone. It can record audio. Just record. Just, um, so just worse than the low quality. But that's yeah, the problem. But that is the problem. That's why people invest in, in good microphones because... You're really serious about it. You don't want to 
Yes, exactly. To get started off, that's a that's a starting point, but to really be serious about it, a good quality microphone and, you know, $100, you can get a good microphone, a USB microphone you plug into your computer and then you can record. So this is a completely different kind of topic, but yeah, podcasting is is uh, could be a viable way also for you to gain an audience, a very um, loyal audience, because when people find podcasts, they really stick with them. And you can be doing, you know, your once a month, your once a week podcast. And to show you it's doable, I have a podcast. You go on iTunes, search VM Campos. I talk about my one of my hobbies. Um, in the podcast section. So when are you going to do podcast tours? Uh, I have no idea. You can sell the old better in our iTunes. It's a joke to the You can sell equipment on the side, too. Yes. <laughs> oh, there it is right there. So I have a problem with that. I won't tell you. So it's about uh, comics. And um, there's a few episodes right there, not too long, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. Uh, oh, look, that one's popular and that one too. So, uh, yeah, you can do all of this and... Uh, is it just you or are you talking to somebody else? At the moment, it's just myself, but I do have an episode or two lined up where I talk to someone else, and then I'm, I'm looking for people in this space to talk to. And so if you know anything about comics and want to talk about comics, come on my podcast. I yes. didn't advert your play a subject here, but for a podcast, if you look on iTunes to find you or anyone, are you paying them a service to, to hold your recordings? Or? The... Um, there's a couple of ways to do it. The way I'm doing it is um, iTunes themselves doesn't hold your podcast. You have to store it somewhere, and then iTunes distributes it, basically. So uh, it's a bit of a process. Uh, that's why a, a class would be great for it to go through all the details. Yeah, I don't want to do it. Can you put it directly on your WordPress site and host it yourself through your WordPress? It's not very reliable, but here's the way I'm doing it. You go to soundcloud.com and create a free account, and they will give you space to upload any audio that you want. Uh, there's a free account, which has a limit to how much you can upload, but to start off, it might be good. And then it has a subscription that you can pay. You can look it up here, how, however much it costs. But the way I'm doing it is I've uploaded my episodes to my free SoundCloud account, and then I've linked that to my iTunes account, and there's my episodes. So then anyone with <laughs> iTunes or Android or whatever can, can download the episodes. So it is a bit of a process, but the cool thing is that if you get a SoundCloud account, they have the documentation there how to set it up. Mm -hmm. So stay tuned for the podcasting class starting in 2017. At the moment, I have the free version, but I'm probably going to get to my limit of space soon, so I'll probably buy the, the account. And uh, somewhere here it'll say how much. It's probably like $40 a year or something, which is not so bad. Now, when you go to their websites, they'll have like five or six different ways to listen to Exactly. Probably yeah. SoundCloud. Yeah. So we've got SoundCloud, uh, and that's a great way to uh, create a podcast for free, put it out there, and then um, link it on iTunes and get more exposure. How much does iTunes take for that? Zero. They don't. Uh, they don't charge you for anything with a podcast. Uh, iTunes charges you if you're selling an app or, uh, or, or, or a music download, but at the moment they're not charging anything for podcasts. I don't know if you said this already, but SoundCloud could be used for musicians as well. Yeah, any sort of sound file. Uh, you, can put, you can put your self-released album up here, 
Uh, and so in here, you can also search for bands, podcasts, and so forth. So if you go here, this is where my original is. So if I search there, it should appear. So yeah, there's the podcast itself. The raw files are here. Uh, and you can subscribe from here, or you can subscribe from iTunes, or you can uh, do whatever. So on a speed, you get more response to the podcast, or you get more to the blog. I haven't looked at my statistics very recently, just because I do a lot of a lot of venues. Uh, Twitter and podcasts and my blog and YouTube and you know there's a healthy amount of traffic and such I haven't really uh, compared them side by side to see where the most traffic and such comes from but I often see that I get a lot of traffic from Google Plus I like using Google Plus and um, if you take my social media class we talk about creating a Google Plus account a Twitter account etc getting followers getting traffic because it's another aspect of SEO you've got a great website no one knows it exists well, you use Google+, Plus, you use Twitter, etc. to get traffic back to your website. So, to finish the idea on number four here, um, I have ghost writers, guest writers, paid writers. Okay, um, I wanted to do it all myself, but then I didn't just get other people in my company that want to write. But let's say I don't have other people within my company that want to write, and I can't do it. I have ghostwriters. So I could have other people that are good at writing, that want to write, to write for me. I can have guest writers and paid writers. The problem with those three, and I don't think it's a real problem, but here's something to think about with these three. Do they know your product good enough? Do they know your brand? Do they know your, your topic enough to write about it? Because... You can look up, you can do a search and look up ghost, blog ghost writers in San Diego. And there's people selling themselves as that. You can hire people to write for you, paid writers. But are they going to know your brand enough, your space enough, your topic enough to write well? Are they going to write in your voice? So I don't quite co consider those negatives because I'm going to take the time to check them out. I'm going to request writing samples. I'm going to see uh, what they've written for other clients. I'm going to research them a little bit. Then I'm going to make the decision to hire them or not. So I'm not going to just hire any ghostwriter, guestwriter, paid writer, just because they're affordable. I remember a few years ago, uh, my, me and Patricia, the other person in, in one of the other people in my company, went to visit someone to get a possible web design job. It didn't go well because that person was very, very cheap and didn't really want to pay for quality stuff. So then when the topic came up, they asked, how much do you charge per, uh, for blog posts? We gave them a quote, and then she laughed and said, I can get someone to write blogs for $20. And I said, great, hire that person to write your blogs for $20. Goodbye. Because for $20 per article or whatever the $20 was, they might not be the best results. They might be, no, no offense to them, but they might be students. They might be, you know, first-year students that are learning this stuff, marketing and such, and maybe they're great. I don't know. But really, with, uh, with anything, you should know. You get what you pay for. You pay a little bit more to get that better countertop. You pay a little bit more to get that better mechanic. You pay a little bit more to get that better blogger, and so forth. Yes? If you were to hire somebody to, to do a blog for you, would you at least dictate um, the subject and the, and the keywords yeah. and that you want so that they... Definitely. Okay. Uh, you definitely want to guide and shape these ghost, uh, these ghost writers, guest writers, paid writers. You definitely want to shape them. You, just, you don't really want to give them free reign and say, hey, write me, write me 10 blog posts. Uh, they might not really be focusing on what you want. They may be good writers, but they may not have, you know, it, the exact uh, uh, SEO focus that they could. So definitely, I would guide them. I would tell them, please write about this, use these keywords, and so forth. Ghost writers are those that write for you and don't claim the credit. 
Uh, you can have these people writing about your, your bakery, but they sign it with your company name. They don't reveal who, who did it. Um, and these can be people that do it for pay or for uh, no, what's known as service for service, that they write something and they get something back from you. Uh, you know, free merchandise or I don't know, whatever deal you want to have. It's completely open. Guest writers. Well, let me jump. Ghost writers to paid writers. Paid writers is okay, obviously. Then you're, you're looking for people that are supposedly good at writing blogs and hire them and they write for you and they're your employee and such and you pay them whatever amount and they may or may not take the credit. They may be a form of ghost writers as well. And guest writers, those are the people that you, you ask to write for you. Let me make notes here. Ghost writers. Is it two words? Ghost writers. Um, write for you anonymously. Paid writers. You know, the big part of that is paid to write for you. Maybe anonymous or not. Ghost writers might be paid. Paid writers are paid. And uh, they may uh, write anonymously or they may take their credit or whatever. It's up to you uh, to decide. Uh, whatever contract you have with them or whatever their terms are, there's many writers out there. So um, really it's, it's a buyer's market. If you want to hire writers, you'll, you'll find the right one and you can um, set up the terms. Guest writers. People from your topic, not from your company. And so I've got this bakery. And let's say I have a good relationship with other people in the food industry. Maybe not directly another bakery, but a restaurateur. And in that restaurant, they have <coughs> these great desserts. So I might get someone that works in that restaurant company to write a blog once in a while, you know, once a quarter, once a year, whatever, just for variety, someone else writing on a topic related to my company for me. Because again, I'm going to get burnt out. If every month I'm the one writing something, I'm going to get burnt out. So if I can mix it up with other people writing something, on whatever regular basis you decide, with whatever compensation you decide, that's good. Especially if it's aligned with your keywords and your topic and your voice. It doesn't actually have to be in, in the voice of your company, really. But your topic, getting other people to write for you. The, the reason why you, you might get guest writers is because that is going to help with backlinks. That other person writes on your blog and what they, at the very minimum, get out of it is a link back to their website. They're getting traffic from your website. Vice versa, you do guest blogging. You find someone in your topic that wants people to write for them. And maybe you don't get paid for it, but the compensation of a link back from their website to your website is very good, especially if their website has more traffic. If I do write a blog post for that restaurant uh, and I write for them why our dessert is amazing and they read it on their website that's, that gets five times more traffic than mine, some traffic is going to come from that blog post back to my website. So more traffic. That's the planning stage of things, things to think about. Again, the more of this that you think about or implement, the better, but you don't have to do all of these. Maybe you never want other people to touch your blog. You're the only one that knows about it. Great. Keep in mind that you want to then uh, have a concept, have variety, and do it regularly. Any general, other general questions of these four items, first four items? Let's take a break. I'll turn the printer on in case you want to print this. When we come back, then we'll start talking about the second section here, writing and all those details.